Hi, I'm Ben, a Technical Enablement Manager here at Sage. This video follows on from a previous one around obtaining a test account and the creation of an application in our app registry. And what we're going to actually do today is have a look at Postman and use that to demonstrate how to actually get started with the API, dealing with authentication and making some first requests. So for those that aren't aware of it, Postman is essentially a platform for all things API development. It allows for the use of APIs like REST, SOAP or GraphQL, automation of testing, API design, documentation and, and more. And for the purposes of today though, we're only going to be using a fraction of what Postman can do, but it will allow you to get up and running testing requests really quickly. So what we'll, we'll do is head over to postman.com slash downloads and choose to download it here. Um, it's available for Windows, Mac OS and Linux and I'm currently using a Mac at the moment so you can see that the, the option here is to download the app. I've already got this installed um, but the installation itself is really really straightforward. So once that's installed you can switch across to Postman and you should see something a little bit like this. We currently have an example Postman collection available as part of the Quick Start Guide and I'll add uh, a link to this in the description as well. Um, and what that does is cover one of the sections of our API reference, specifically around contacts and it covers various endpoints that relate to contacts such as addresses, contact types and, and countries. And if we, we just pop across to the developer portal here. You can see as part of this Quick Start Guide you've got these really handy buttons that Postman provide and when we click it that gives us an option to either open it in the web version of Postman or because I've got this installed here we'll click Postman for Mac and allow and if you look onto the left here there you go straight away we have 27 requests available all around different endpoints that we have in that collection amongst the get post put and delete as well so that's great um, and as I say we, we, we have this collection for this one area but we do intend to be building more to cover the entire of our reference in the future as well. Okay, so now we've got the collection added, let's go and look at arguably what is the most important thing and set up our authentication. So we'll do this as part of a first request. So you can see here we have the URL bar across the top here and this is going to be the actual request URLs, we'll, we'll be populating those shortly. But you can see these various tabs where you can have your various query parameters here, look at the headers, the body of the request. Postman offers the opportunity to do some really cool things with uh, pre-request scripts and tests that you can do in JavaScript and things that will run prior to the request being made. We have got some videos coming in the future where we're working on something that relates to improving the speed at which we can get demo data uh, into your accounting trials so that you've got something to work with straight away. So keep an eye out for that because that will be coming soon. But if we come across here, like I say, to the authorization tab, let's have a little look at this. So within this, we have to choose the correct authorization type. And in this case, that is Auth2. Choose that. And let's come across, I'll bring this response down a bit. And on the right here, you can see this is all the various information that you need to provide Postman in order to go through that authentication process. So what we'll do, we'll start here, or we'll give the token a name. I'm just going to say it's API v3.1. We will leave the grant type as author authorization code, which we need to do. So next you've got this callback URL. Uh, so we need to enter the callback URL that we specified when registering the app in the app registry. And even though this URL won't actually be called when it's used via Postman, it is used to retrieve the authorization code or the access token. And what I would stress is that it is so, so, so important that this is entered exactly the same way that you added it when you registered the app. Otherwise it won't successfully authenticate and likely you'll see a message returned uh, in the form of an authorized application error. And 99% of the time, should you see that, it will be a case of double checking that callback URL and there'll have been a mistake made somewhere. So in order to populate this, if we pop back to the app registry and we go to there we can see here the callback URL I specified earlier 
So I'm just going to copy that. And I'll pop that back in. Authorize using browser. I mean, you can do that if you want, and all that will happen is during the authorization process, it will pop uh, your default browser as opposed to just handling it within the Postman app itself. That can be handy if you want to see the URLs that are being called, um, you know, and, and you need to actually see the authentication code and things like that. Next, we have the auth URL, and this is the URL for Sage Business Cloud Accounting's authorization server, and is used essentially when going through that initial request for an authentication code, which is then subsequently exchanged for an access token. The minimum that you need to specify here it is, I'll just paste that in. Yeah, so sage1.com slash auth2 slash auth slash central. There are also optional query parameters that you can add to effectively predetermine that the region that you wish to connect to. And for certain locales that you can also specify the language that the authorization pop-up will be in. Next up, we have the token URL. And that is, as the name suggests, used to make a request uh, to exchange the uh, authentication code for an access token that was received in the previous step. And that will always be auth.accounting.sage.com slash token. Next, you can see we have sections for the client ID and client secret. And we need to pop over to the app registry for these and enter them exactly as they are displayed there. So we'll go over, specify the client ID. Which is the unique identifier for your application. And you can see on the right here as well, Postman is suggesting that we use a variable in place of the client ID. It also does the same for the secret um, because we want to keep those secure um, because they are identifiers, as I say, for, for the app and, and define certain things like access time and things like that. Um, the use of variables in Postman is something that we're going to be covering in a future video, but essentially think of it like anything else. You've got a variable in the form of a placeholder and you can hide them at the environment level, global level, collections uh, and various other bits as well. Um, all have different scopes across what you're trying to do within Postman itself. So some interesting uses there. Um, but yeah, don't worry too much for now about this warning triangle. We'll get the client secret and paste him in as well. So next we want to look at the scope and that's effectively determining the whole raw access for this request. Um, in the case of accounting, really, it's, it's only ever going to be read only or full access. Uh, so for the sake of this, I will choose full access. What I would say though, is that really it's the permission set of the authenticating user that fundamentally determines which modules or area of that accounting business that they have access to. And the last section we're going to do anything with here is the state. And it, it is optional, but it's essentially just a, a, a string that you provide that is used to help identify potentially forged requests for, you know, or something like a man in the middle attack, that, that kind of thing. So for that, I'm just going to do something really exciting. Fantastic. And we can leave the client authentication type as basic auth header. It will work either way. It's no problem. So the next thing to do is try and actually test this out and request an access token. And so as I discussed before, because we didn't set any optional parameters in relation to the auth URL, um, it will come up and ask us which country or region where the business is that we're trying to connect to. In this case, we're gonna choose United Kingdom. And then we have a login prompt. And this is the credentials that are being used for the actual business itself. So when you're logging into your accounting business, the email address and password. So I'll just do that. And then we just choose to log in. And as I mentioned as well in the previous section, when we're in the app registry, you can see how important it is that we make sure that the application name is correct and also the imagery that's used because that really does help your customers to know that what they're about to do is is safe you know it is coming from a legitimate place so all we need to do is say okay we want read write access we're going to allow that and in the background retrieved an access an access token and that will be displayed well, click proceed there you go so you can see we have returned an access token there 
and also further down you you also get the, the refresh token which can be exchanged uh, to use in order to request a new access token and effectively keep the uh, keep the connection alive so but we'll, we're going to have other bits on that and more detail about that in in a section on on just authentication itself so we're going to say that we want to use that token and you can see that's populated up here so what we're going to do is just make a quick test request you see the api url api.accounting.sage.com forward slash v3.1 and then it's the contacts endpoint that i'm going to make a get request on and let's see what we get returned i'll just move this up a little bit and here in the response body you can see we have three contacts returned the two default ones that you have for VAT reclaim and payments to HMRC here in the UK. But also, if you recall at the start of the video, when we first got our accounting business set up, we created a contact test 001, and there it is. And so one thing I'm going to do as part of this, we're going to take a copy of the ID for the contact. And another thing that we can do is just put another slash on the end and specify the key for the specific contact that we're interested in. So if we make a subsequent get request, you can see the kind of data that were returned. We get an awful lot more than that was nested in the main get request to contacts. To cover off here is how to post an invoice real quick, just so you can see how straightforward that is. Uh, in order to do that, three specific IDs that we're gonna need is the contact ID, so we know which customer that's gonna be associated with, and also on those invoices, you're going to have a separate invoice lines. And so for the sake of this example, I'll just do one. Um, but on there, we want to specify a product and also the ledger that that goes to. So in this case, we want to associate the net value of a line item with a specific ledger account. So let's get started with that. So I will just copy this contact address ID rather. That's the name. And one thing I did off camera is I created a demo. Ah, right, good. I'm glad this has happened now so we can cover this off. So one thing I will stress is that the access token expiry time is five minutes. It can't, that can't be changed. And so if you want, and I'm assuming you will do, if you want your users to stay connected for a specific period of time, you will need to, uh, to use the refresh token in order to um, maintain that connection and keep it alive. But we will have a separate section, as I've said, I think before already, that goes into detail about authentication and, and how you can handle the token and various things you can do in terms of revoking it and, and things like that. So in this case, though, it's dead straightforward because it's already the cookies are cached and we've got everything there. It's just a matter of requesting a new one. So we're going to use that. Lovely. So let's try that request again. Products. Fantastic. This is a product for our demo. So I'll just copy the ID of him as well. And then the last one, as I mentioned before, will be the ledger accounts. And you can see that the first 20 results are returned. But by the looks of it, we're going to need a sales code. Now, I know that's into the 4000 range. And so what we'll need to do is add a query parameter of items per page and uh, let's just say 100 and I think that should do it and there you go so now we have 100 and we return an awful lot more so I'm going to keep going until I find a sales code which I believe yep yeah, perfect sale for products of 4000 so I'm just going to copy this ID here as well and paste that into some JSON that I've got off camera here Right, so now I have all the IDs that I need. The next thing that we need to do is come across to change the request type to a post request and the endpoint to sales invoices. And then what we're looking to do is update the, the body here. Now, this is set to raw, raw JSON. And what I can do is I've just been copying and pasting those IDs as we've been going through, as I say, into this JSON here. And so what we've got Obviously, we're specifying a sales invoice. We're specifying the date. 
the contact ID, so this is the ID of the customer, the invoice number, which it is passed as a string, but one thing that was brought to my attention recently is that it, it can be passed as a string or an integer, but it must be positive, as you'd expect. There is a, a prefix that is determined in accounting of SI, specific to invoices, it's SI hyphen and then whatever number that you pass in here. And then also for the invoice lines, as I said before, we have specific line items in the invoices and each of those are made up within the invoice lines array. So we have the product ID that we copied before for our, for our demo product. You can override the description as I've done here. The ledger account ID that we want it to go, and as we checked before, that's to 4,000. The quantity of that particular product that's being sold, the unit price, and the tax rate ID we're specifying here is GB standard. And given the way that accounting is set up, that will be 20%. So all that's left now is to give it a will and send that request. And there you go, we have a successful creation, a 201 returned. And here are the full details of the invoice that we've posted. Fantastic, all done. So now we know we have an account that we can access all the way through development and testing. We have a registered application with credentials and we know how to edit that. And last, we know how to get started with Postman, fire off some requests and see what comes back. Along with all the documentation and us on hand to help, everything should go smoothly from here. Thanks a lot.